Aloha, and welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live at 2 o'clock every Thursday here in the Think Tech Studios in downtown Honolulu in the Pioneer Plaza. We are a story, we are stories. The show is about stories of successful business in Hawaii. Uh, and I do have a, a couple of PSAs, public service announcements, that I'd like to get into that kind of highlights a little bit about the success stories. Now, we, we've heard about Hawaii not being the best place in the country to do business. Uh, it's difficult, it's challenging, it's too expensive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I just wanted to highlight uh, that the PBN uh, last week had their fastest 50 and they awarded uh, different uh, rankings to 50 different companies uh, throughout the state and I just wanted to mention that the 50th the lowest ranked company in the PBN list number 50 was the right slice which is from Kauai and she was a guest on here I guess uh, about six months ago uh, but their growth rate was 48.5 percent any company that can grow 48% in one year is successful. And that was the lowest rank one. So <clears throat> it'd be interesting. I would imagine that there's well over several hundred companies that are growing at 10 to 15%. Uh, that's, that's, to me, an indication of success here in Hawaii. So, you know, we do have success stories. We do have people that have made it work. Yes, there are challenges, but the, uh, the PBN list, the fastest 50 shows uh, that we do uh, indeed have people that can make it work here in Hawaii. A couple other quick announcements that I want to make before we get into uh, our guest today. Uh, one, I just got a, a notice from the IRS, and this is very timely with all the students going back to school. Uh, there is a new tax scam going around. Uh, there's being calls made to homes, uh, and they're asking for payments related to the federal student tax and that they're behind and their children will not be allowed to go to school. Uh, they might even be arrested. So they need payment immediately uh, for this balance <clears throat> due on federal student tax. It's a scam. Do not pay it. Hang up. And I would suggest that if you get any phone calls from the IRS or any tax department or agency for that matter re demanding payment, um, don't comply. Uh, maybe give them a call back on a, a line that you can get somewhere that uh, is on the internet or uh, you know through the, the phone book if people still use that uh, or call your CPA or tax advisor you know the taxing agencies normally do not call up and make threats like that so be very careful and please avoid this federal student tax scam that's going on right now um, as some of you may know, I am on the national board for uh, the Small Business Administration's Financial uh, Regulatory Review Board. Um, I'm the chair of the Ninth Region. We do have a roundtable coming up. Uh, people are invited. If you're a small business and you have a, a complaint about a federal rule or regulation or a challenge you might have at the federal level, we'd love for you to come out to the, uh, the roundtable and share that with us. That's on Tuesday, August 23rd at the SBA district offices uh, at Restaurant Row. So love to see you there. And then finally, uh, the Hawaii Kai Chamber of Commerce is having a luncheon where I'm a speaker and I'm going to be doing a, a business update uh, at that chamber luncheon. That's going to be out in Hawaii Kai on August 24th <clears throat> at the Outback Steakhouse. So hope to see you there. Now I'd like to jump right into the, the guest today, uh, Steve Pengree. Uh, he's an attorney. Uh, he spends a lot of uh, time, criminal tax attorney, financial um, law uh, issue. I mean, he's got a, a very broad background and, and very interesting website where he talks about some of this. He just wrote an article uh, about some of the challenges that the uh, medical <coughs> marijuana industry has with bank accounts, and he has some thoughts about that. But we're going to probably cover a lot of different areas that's got to do with uh, criminal tax and, and foreign bank accounts and that sort of thing. But Steve, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to reoccur. Yes, uh, <laughs> recurring, <laughs> returning guest. Thanks. Um, you just wrote this article, uh, and it talks a little bit about some of the uh, issues with the banking side of the medical marijuana business. Can you kind of share some of what you wrote about with us today? Sure, I'd be happy to. The biggest problem that 
med medical marijuana and marijuana businesses have nationwide is they do not have access to bank accounts. And this creates a lot of problems, as you can well imagine. First of all, just the payment of their taxes. Many taxes are paid through e-filing through your bank account. Or well, payment for anything, for that matter. And that's true. And also, um, you know, their payroll taxes and, yeah. and that type of thing. The problem is, and most people think it's just the banks don't like marijuana and they don't want to be involved with this kind of sordid business and that type of thing. That's really not the truth. because. Marijuana businesses earn a lot of money, gross income, and they would deposit a lot of money in the bank, so the banks would like to have the business. The problem is that still today, marijuana is listed as a controlled substance on the Schedule One, which means it's an illegal narcotic drug, and it's illegal to possess or to traffic in it, or in other words, earn money from mm -hmm. the sale of marijuana. And were to have any business that, if you will, touches marijuana proceeds. So the banks are governed by the Department of the Treasury, the, what they call FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, and the Department of Justice, and they have all these rules and regulations that deal with what they can and they cannot do. Um, the problem is it's the risk that the banks run if they do deal, because in 2014, the Department of the Treasury and the Department of Justice came out with some uh, opinions, basically, that said the banks are uh, allowed or given permission to deal with medical marijuana businesses if they follow certain know-your-customer protocol and certain anti-money laundering protocol, mm. uh, due diligence type of protocol of their customers. The key is that the banks are allowed to engage with marijuana businesses if they are willing to assume the risk. What risk is that? Money laundering, primarily. And money laundering is basically the process of making dirty money look clean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, what the banks are particularly concerned about is they don't know the source of the cash. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't know where it's coming from. Presumably it's coming just from this one business uh, that happens to sell, grow and sell marijuana here in Hawaii, for example. But the banks don't know that. They don't know the customers. They don't know the original source of the cash. They're concerned that it may come from uh, either black market marijuana sales or cartel, you know, organized crime and that sort of thing. Or other drug type, you know, which I think you just mentioned. I mean, there could be a lot of different drugs involved in, in this cash generation. So That's, you know, that's true. Risky. Crystal meth, uh, opioids, yeah. you know, yep. cocaine and so on. So the, the banks have very strict criteria for, I won't go into all of them, but there's eight or nine criteria for vetting or examining their customers. Mm -hmm. And although this doesn't directly relate to money laundering, it does relate to increased regulation. If you've ever tried to open a bank account in the last couple, three years, especially if you have a company trying to open a bank account, you know that it's very difficult. You can't just give them your driver's license and sign you know, they require a tremendous amount of information. Well, you know, and, and I have a little bit of a bank uh, background in the banking industry, and I right. know sometimes when you open up the bank account, it's not only, particularly for a business, not getting proper identification and all the different support for the, mm -hmm. the entity itself, but you're even required to go out and do a drive-by the business mm -hmm. and take a look at the business and make sure it's a legitimate address and it's right. not a post office box or something like that. So, you know, they've they gotten pretty serious about trying to, to have a really good handle on who the customer is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very true. And what I've suggested in the article, specifically for the medical marijuana businesses in Hawaii, is a list of seven or eight what I would call anti-money laundering protocols that the marijuana medical marijuana businesses could institute within their own house if you will mm. so that they know their customers and they do a due diligence and they keep records and they keep track and and that type of thing and so, so this pushes the burden a little bit over onto the actual uh, medical marijuana businesses themselves to do some of this know your customer work for the bank exactly and and the marijuana businesses need to understand that it's their responsibility to know their customers and to go to the bank and say, look, here's my state registration, here's my Department of Health application, here's all of my employees, here are all the criminal background checks of all our employees. You know, in other words, give the bank a comfort package mm. so that the bank will, will feel like the risk that they're taking has been ameliorated as much as possible. Right. Um, now, I would imagine that, that if they put these best practices into use at the business level, mm -hmm 
they need to have some documentation of what they're doing, right? Exactly. Yeah. And they can do that. You know, they, first of all, when patients come in to buy medical marijuana, they have to register. And they're registered with the State Department of Health and all that's in, in the computers. And the, uh, you know, the dispensary, if you will, will know each and every patient. You know. uh, and they, of course, have financial records and have records of the, that tie into the, the marijuana that they grew and that they sold so you can, they can demonstrate that it didn't come from a black market outside source and that type of thing. Now, you know, some of what we've talked about in the past that I know you've got experience with is, is doing currency reports. Right. You know, um, and I would imagine there's, there's going to be a lot of cash moving through here. There is. Um, and so would the uh, medical marijuana business be required to do these currency transaction reports? Yes. First of all, the business itself, right in the beginning, if they receive more than $10,000 in cash, and this is kind of interesting, but it's, so, it's supposed to be from any one transaction, so, which is kind of interesting because most transactions are two, $300 or something like that. But anyway, if they have received, let's say, in a day $10,000 in cash, they are probably required to fill out what's called a Form 8300, the receipt of more than $10,000. Mm -hmm. That's number one. That goes to the IRS. Then when they go to the bank with their ten or fifteen or $30,000 in cash, the bank will fill out what's called a currency transaction report mm -hmm. that identifies the, the depositor, the customer, and the source of the funds, and all that's sent to the IRS. And then there's another report called a suspicious activity report, or an SAR, that the banks file unbeknownst to the customer if they feel that there's something that's not quite right. You know, the, the deposits are out of sync or that there's a sudden huge increase in cash deposits, which might indicate that maybe the customer's taken in a little extra money from a black market source and put it with their source. Would a series of $9,000 deposits be suspicious? Absolutely. That's called structuring your deposits, uh, you know, multiple deposits under the $10,000 reporting right. limit to avoid the currency transaction report. That's a felony. It's a five-year felony, $250,000 fine. It's a serious... They, they take it seriously. And there's right. also there's monetary penalties too, right? Yeah, up to $250,000, yeah. plus a forfeiture of the funds. Yeah. So if it, you, it adds up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and so I guess in, in some respects, it's better to over-report than under-report? Yes, and, in, and not in particular. I mean, all businesses should, but in particular because the medical marijuana businesses are under such scrutiny mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and criticism, if you will, uh, they should be very, very... Well, and I, I think until things settle down, they're going to be under a microscope, and people are going to be right. watching them really close. That's true. And, and there's, and it's not just the currency. There's a lot of compliance issues that I think is is mm -hmm. uh, you know going to be a way of life for some of the medical marijuana mm -hmm. business. Right. Um, but we're we're going to have to go on a short break here. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, we just whipped right through the first 14 minutes. There's a so, lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah. No, we're we're going to take a, a, a short one minute break. Uh, we're going to come right back uh, with Steve Pengree, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the, uh, the criminal activity reporting that might be needed if you do a lot of uh, currency or have foreign bank accounts. We'll be right back. Aloha. My name is John Waihe, and I actually had a small part to do with what's happening today. Served, actually, in public office. But if you don't already know that, here's a chance to learn more about what's happening in our state by joining me for Talk Story with John Waihe every other Monday. Thank you, and I look forward to your seeing us in the future. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Welcome back to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're here today with Steve Bengri, 
We're talking a little bit about some of the, the, the criminal aspects of having foreign bank accounts and having cash transactions. Uh, in Hawaii, we've got this new industry, the medical marijuana uh, industry, that's uh, slowly starting to get some momentum going. Uh, and there are a lot of issues, a lot of compliance challenges ahead of them. Uh, we talked a little bit about how we can maybe set some procedures up where it might make it a little bit easier for the <coughs> banks that l at least consider opening a bank account. Uh, and Steve, appreciate all your thoughts on this. Uh, we're going to maybe switch gears a, a little bit and get into a little uh, of the foreign bank accounts. It's been in the news a lot. Everybody's been talking about uh, you got to report the foreign banks. Uh, some of the foreign bank uh, entities themselves are sharing information with the Treasury and the IRS. Uh, could you give us a quick you know, summary? What's going on there? <laughs> uh, the United States government in the last within the last 10 years, let's just say, they had basically created all of these rules to force foreign banks to divulge information and turn it over to the United States Internal Revenue Service. So uh, of bank accounts held by U.S. citizens in foreign bank accounts. Does it just U.S. citizens or can it be like green card holders or? It, that's a very good point. It's any U.S. taxpayer, okay. which is a U.S. citizen, a green card holder, which is a U.S. resident alien is what mm -hmm. they call them. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of green card holders don't understand that they have to pay U.S. taxes, just like a regular <laughs> U.S. citizen. And also some businesses that do business in the U.S. They may be foreign owned, but if they do business in the U.S., they're considered a business tax right. person. And so okay. there's, there's two basic reports. One is called an FBAR or a foreign uh, bank account report. And this is a separate report from the tax return itself, return yeah. itself, right, exactly. And it has to be filed once a year by June 30th, and it has to be filed online. And essentially, if you have a foreign bank account and you have more than $10,000 U.S. value in that bank account at any given time during the year, so it could go up and then down at the end of the year if it's less than 10,000. If it broke 10,000 during a year, you got to report it. Exactly. And most people, many people don't know about the FBAR report, the foreign bank account report. And a lot of people, again, who are uh, resident aliens or green card holders, they don't understand that they're treated just like U.S. taxpayers. So. Now, there's, there's a little nuance in there that I've, I've read, don't totally understand it. Maybe you can explain it. Um, it doesn't, does the account have to be in your name or do you just, what if you have access to it and you can get your hands on it? If you have signatory con authority over a foreign bank account or if you have control over the foreign bank account. It doesn't have to be in your name. That's correct. But for example, if you have a, a corporation or a company, you know, overseas uh, in some foreign country and, uh, you know, the owners or the directors or so on or somebody else, but you're actually a majority owner or you own more than 10% of that corporation. And so you have voting authority. You have to file you a report. FBAR report. What if your mom is in a foreign country and you are, you, you're on the, the signature card and you can have access to that account, but she's got twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 over there? You are required to file the FBAR there report you, okay. because you have accounts. You know, it's, it's a big problem in Hawaii because we have a lot of people who are immigrants. And that's why I brought that exactly. up, is that mm -hmm. there are a lot of these connections. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the penalties for noncompliance are pretty stiff. They're very stiff. Uh, first of all, if it's a willful noncompliance, if somebody just says, I don't want the government knowing my information and they don't file, that's a criminal offense. And it's punishable by prison and very large fines. And a felony, right? And a felony, that's correct. The second is sort of a negligent, but you know, civil type of uh, non-compliance. And that, those penalties can range up to 100% of the value of the account each year. So now, filing it, basically we're just talking about a reporting process. Correct. In, in a lot of cases, there's not a tax implication. It's just a reporting process. That's correct. Because many times some people you know, have earned money in the U.S. and they deposit it for whatever reason in the home country of their spouse, for example. And they've already paid taxes on it. And they've already it. paid taxes on it. But if they earn interest or a return on that money, then they have to pay tax on the income. Just Which could be nominal. 
Correct. I mean, on twenty thousand dollars, the interest on that these days is not going to be a whole lot. So, right. you know, and you earn interest of a few hundred dollars. The tax on it might only be twenty or thirty dollars. You mm -hmm. don't want to run and jeopardize right. anything that you've got uh, by not reporting. That's correct. That's correct. And you can find the report. Uh, you go to irs.gov and look for forms and look for FBAR. I won't give you the number of it, but just look for FBAR report and, and you can find it online and, uh, and report it. The other issue is on a person's tax return. Mm. And this is, uh, there's two check boxes on, well, you know better than I, but on Schedule B, which follows Schedule A, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's two boxes and one says, I, ha I do or do not have a foreign bank account in excess of $10,000. That's yes or no. Uh, the second one is, I do or do not have a controlling interest in a business, a foreign business that, uh, of it, I forget what the number is, more than $50,000, something like that. You know, I don't have more than 50,000 in financial assets in a foreign country, and you check that box, yes or no. It's a, you sign the tax return under a penalty of perjury. Mm -hmm. So if you check no, or tell your accountant to check no, and then you sign under penalty of perjury, and that turns out not to be true, then you are guilty of filing a false tax return, which is a three-year felony, and civil penalties, and, and so on. And from what I understand, I think you shared with me earlier that they can confiscate the balance in the account? That's correct. That's correct. So that's pretty stiff. That's right. The, the fines are up to... 27% to 100% of the account balance, plus they can confiscate the, the account balance itself in a very egregious situation, but still. And it, it's a good time to bring this up because a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, are on extension right now and will be signing their tax returns, either their corporate return in, what, September 15th, I think, and then their individual return by yep. October 15th. So they really need to pay attention to Schedule B they do and, and you know the reporting is a separate reporting it's you know if you do have the balances of 10,000 or more right. you do have to report them and it's not part of the tax return years ago I think there was a form you could attach but they right. stopped doing that so now you got to go online and actually file this report separately now some tax preparers could probably help you with that but not all of them you know and so you need to ask uh, but it's not a difficult process, but you do have to set up an account to do this online when you do it. Right. Uh, you know, and for the sake of filing this one report, uh, you, it, it's wise to do it because the repercussions can be very, very right. large. That's true. Uh, that's very, very true, everything that you just said. And, and you know, it, it's the comment basically is the government has been increasingly adding on and piling on these mm -hmm. regulations, not only to American taxpayers, which takes time, money, energy, and knowledge, to, which a lot of people just don't have in this area, um, but also foreign banks. There's another new law called the Foreign Account Compliance Tax Act, FACTA, they call it, which came into enforcement in 2015, which requires foreign bank accounts, um, sorry, that's probably the uh, the IRS calling to you know get name and number and something address. like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, right, right. They, they, they're saying I owe them money. <laughs> uh, by the way, parenthetically, the to go back to what you talked about in the beginning, the IRS never calls people to collect money. Never. So anytime someone calls on the phone and says I'm from the IRS and you owe us money and we're going to sue you, that's a scam. That's they, always they, good to know. They never call. So. And sometimes they can be very aggressive. Exactly. And, you know, and scary. And people can get intimidated. Mm -hmm. And so don't let that happen. If you're intimidated, just hang up. Exactly. You don't have to listen to them. Right. Just remember, they never, the IRS never calls people. So unless you have an appointment. But, okay. <laughs> Where were we? Oh, the FACTA. The, the Foreign Account Compliance Tax Act requires all about 100 plus banks, institutions, and their branches, of course, throughout the world to report the account information of all U.S. taxpayers to the U.S. Internal Revenue Service. Mm. How do you like that? Mm. And you know, you say, well, why would the foreign banks want to do that? And the, it's because the U.S. government has said if the foreign banks do not cooperate, 
they do not have access to the American capital market. That's huge. You That's know better huge. than I. That's it, I mean, huge. It's huge. Yeah. Well, I mean, just think of all the, the transactions that take place in, in New York and San Francisco through the Federal Reserve System, mm -hmm. the clearing of the checks. Right. You know, we're not just talking about deposits. We're talking about the entire movement of money on an international basis, which at one point or another almost always gets into the mm -hmm. U.S. banking system. Right. You know, and not having access to that could actually ruin the bank. Mm -hmm. And which is why over a hundred and some odd foreign banks have signed up. And, and again, this isn't just, you know, one bank in one country. It may be one big bank in a country with 500 different branches. That's right. You know, that's and, right. And, uh, but anyway, that's, those are things to be very aware of right now is uh, if you have a foreign bank account, if you are married to a person who is from another country and who has family in the country, like you talked about the German person, their family may in, in a foreign country have bank accounts or, pro or own property that also have the names of the children who happen to be U.S. citizens right. on the accounts. And it can really create a big problem. Well, in, we're in a final minute or so of the program, and sure. so I just wanted to, we've been talking a lot about individuals, but if there's a foreign company mm -hmm. that, say, is in Hong Kong or Japan or China, and they have a bank account in a foreign bank, but they're doing a lot of business in the U.S., mm -hmm. um, what kind of reporting requirements would they have? Businesses that operate in the United States and you know earn income in the United States, it, as a general rule, are treated just like U.S. taxpayers. Okay. Now, they're not taxed on their worldwide income. Right. For example, the Japanese shareholders in Japan. But the business in the U.S. is taxed. And right. also, the beneficial owners of that American business have to report any foreign bank accounts that they may have. Right, and those bank accounts, again, may not trigger a tax, it's just a reporting process That's that they correct. have. So, all right, very good. Well, you know, Steve, it's always a pleasure to have you on the, the show. Mm -hmm. um, you always scare the bejiggers out of us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to do that. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, but this is important for people to know mm -hmm. because if, you know, to get into something that uh, could come as a surprise down the road mm -hmm. uh, would not be good. And, and so it's good to know this stuff so we can take some steps to protect ourselves. Sure. So thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Uh, this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast every Thursday at 2 o'clock. Uh, we try to highlight uh, different success stories in Hawaii and, and have topics that are important to the small business community. So thank you for tuning in today and hope to see you next week. Aloha.